Alcohol is often cited as the main muse of the writer. From Kingsley Amos to Dylan Thomas, pen monkeys have literally been drunk on words. Alcohol would also be influential on Geoffrey Treese, the prolific author of 113 books, who finally called it a day at 88. But don't get excited. He wasn't a literary lush who got into Bukowski and brawls. His parents ran a family wine and spirit shop at Number One Castlegate, the narrow Georgian street leading up to the castle, just a few doors away from a surgical appliance firm where D.H. Lawrence did a brief stint as a clerk. It's now called Weaver's, and if you're very nice, they might just show you around the rooms that would kickstart the career of one of Nottingham's most prolific, yet least celebrated writers. As a nipper, Treese would accompany his father to work and pass his time taking the stamps off the violet-inked envelopes from the shippers of Bordeaux, presumably fostering his intrigue of travel, which would later manifest itself in his children's fiction that spanned the globe and depicted just about every major historical event, from ancient Athens to the Bolshevik Revolution. The family business also gave him access to paper, then an expensive commodity, in the form of a desk diary usually used to record exports. It was here he recorded his first stories. Treese grew up in three houses in Nottingham, but the family home at 142 Portland Road, a tall semi close to the Arboretum, would have a profound effect on his imagination. The surrounding roads were named after the likes of Cromwell, Raleigh, Chaucer and Shakespeare, a constant reminder of the men who had defined history and culture. As World War I drew to a close in 1918, the nine-year-old Treese was reminded that the glory of great men came with brutal consequences. As he recorded, I lay in bed with the influenza that was raging across Europe and listened to the horse-drawn funerals rumbling and clattering down our cobbled road on their way to the cemetery. One body not on the cart was that of his uncle Sid, a second lieutenant in the Sherwood Foresters, who'd gone missing at the front. Treese's grandma was so distraught at his disappearance that she refused to allow his name to appear on the school war memorial in the hope that one day he would turn up. All they ever found was his helmet. The mental seeds were slowly being sown for a writer who would later prioritise human feelings above national interests in his depictions of conflict. Treese did well at school, and won an honorary foundation scholarship to Nottingham High School. The school's boys' library gave access to a treasure trove of adventure stories, introducing the likes of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Jules Verne. This was important, as his father had banned visits to the public library because he believed it was infested with noxious germs. Early on, Treese demonstrated a flair for business as well as creativity when he started a school magazine. Issues were loaned out at a penny a night. When he won the Junior Sir Thomas White Scholarship, awarded to boys under 13 already in the school, he persuaded his father to buy him a typewriter. That was as heavy as a piece of artillery. Now he could up his output and publish a school paper for private circulation. ka -ching. His first pay commission came at 13, when he sold an article to a popular boys' weekly for half a guinea. Soon afterwards, he'd had a poetry collection accepted for publication, albeit by a dubious company who insisted on the author coughing up half of the printing costs. Tree excelled at the high school and was a regular winner of prizes, the profits of which went on books. In 1924, he purchased a copy of Roger's Theosaurus, having read that every serious writer should have one on his desk. He won a scholarship to Oxford to study classics and looked destined for a comfortable career in academia, but dropped out after his first year in 1929. I was bored to death with this musty scholarship, this wearsome gibberish concocted by the pedants. One year of Oxford, at its driest, unrelieved by one flash of inspiration, humour or understanding from any don concerned with me, had suffocated the enthusiasm with which I'd gone up from school. I told myself, if I went on like this for another three years, I should hate the classics, 
for the rest of my life. He swapped Oxford for the slums of East End of London, working at a settlement which, for an expiring writer anxious to study human nature, was a living laboratory. The settlement was run by the Leicester sisters, one of whom was a personal friend of Gandhi. Muriel Leicester lived by Gandhi's philosophy that one must approach the poor with the mind of the poor and this informed her approach to community service. Consequently, the most important task Treese was given was keeping the building clean and tidy. A lot of the people coming into the building in the evening had laboured hard that day, and so it was felt they were more likely to listen and respect those with equally dirty hands. Aside from cleaning and stoking fires, Treese ran library supervision sessions as well as escorting masses of children to theatre productions. For these services, that seemed to straddle everything from cleaner to youth worker, he was paid board and lodgings and seven shillings a week. The whole experience offered a grounding in humanity that was absent from Oxford and no doubt went some way into shaping the drive for equality that would see him revolutionise children's stories by giving meaningful roles to both male and female characters. As a writer, Treese's general philosophy was to avoid abstractions and generalisations and treat children as intelligent readers. Up to 1945, it was an unacknowledged preconception that children lacked experience. Historical accuracy was fundamental to this principle, but not to the extent that this suffocated the enjoyment of a good story. As Margaret Meek has noted, a familiar theme in Treese's work is the way that men will defend their homes and the places they have built their roots, which is the basis for just about every historical story from the Civil War to the French Revolution. Treese was ahead of his time in recognising that the stories we tell children will have an impact on how they view the world as an adult, particularly the jingoism that presented all war as glorious and the superiority of the visitors. Therefore, he offered more complex portrayals of people and communities. In Mist over Althini, we see how the divisions created by the Roman Empire live on long after the conquerors have left. They had taken the empty shell which Rome had left them and filled it, not with a new city, but with a jumble of farms and cottages. Each lived inside his stockade, as though they were not friends and neighbours outside, but prowling wolves at the forest. Where the ground permitted, where the spade did not yield Roman concrete, tile or brick, the Englishman made a garden or an orchard. In arguably his most famous novel, Bows Against the Barons, published in 1934, Treese gave the Hood legend a working over. He was frustrated that, Robin Hood is about the only proletarian hero our children are permitted to admire, yet even he is not allowed to remain an ordinary working man. He has to be really the Earl of Huntingdon. Tree set out to demonstrate that harsh winters left the likes of Robin Hood starving and frail and that life wasn't always merry in the Emerald Forest. It would lead to George Orwell complimenting Treese as that creature we have long been needing a light left-wing writer, rebellious but human, a sort of P.G. Woodhouse after a course of Marx. As he developed his craft and became more aware of the responsibilities of a writer, Treese would renounce his earlier propagandist novels, such as Comrades for the Charter, published in 1934, and The Call to Arms, published the following year, arguing that a children's writer should have the same sort of professional ethic as a teacher. Whatever his personal beliefs, he mustn't use his position of professional advantage to press party politics on readers too immature to argue with him on fair terms. These principles will be cemented in Tales Out of School, published in 1949, the first wide-ranging survey of 20th century children's literature which concluded that the best books confirm and extend the child's own experience. A good book, he wrote, uses language skillfully to entertain and represent reality, to stimulate the imagination, 
or to educate the emotions. The book, along with his others, will be instrumental in driving up literacy levels, encouraging reading and bridging the gap between the comic and the classics.